All right, listen, I know many people are gonna read the title of this video and their immediate response is gonna be, shut up, you weeaboo, but just hear me out for a minute. I am going somewhere with this. I'm not just saying this because I love anime and glorious Nippon is the best and they make things much better than the trash that Americans make. Uh, there is actually something here worth talking about that I think doesn't get discussed nearly enough. And I think by going into this, I will be able to answer a couple of questions that I've seen multiple times, both in my videos and just in the general Sonic community at large, which is why are there a certain sect of Sonic fans, like myself, who are so dismissive of non-Japanese Sonic works, talking about like the English dubs and how they rewrote a lot of the games and changed the characterization, or a lot of the stuff from the American lore of Sonic, you know, Mobius, Robotnik, Chili Dogs, things like that. The American cartoons and just the general Western side of production with the whole Sonic universe. Personally, I do not care for that stuff pretty much at all, and I will oftentimes completely dismiss that when talking about the Sonic series, the characters, the storylines, etc., etc., and I often am met with some resistance by some people about that stuff that I, you know, am very elitist for only wanting to acknowledge and incorporate Japanese Sonic works and completely dismiss everything else. Because Sonic was made for America, admittedly so by the creators. They specifically designed Sonic to appeal to the West. And that most definitely ended up working out exactly as planned, because Sonic is far more popular in the West than he is in Japan. So of course, it can come off as very close-minded that people like me specifically focus on the original Japanese nature of Sonic. But the thing that you need to understand is the reason I care so much about the Japanese side of Sonic, and not at all about the other sides of Sonic, is because Sonic is very, very Japanese in every single aspect, pretty much. Even though it was made to appeal to the West, that doesn't change the fact that it was made by Japanese people who understand Japanese storytelling concepts, characterization, and a general approach to art. If you look at the Sonic series at large and the way that it handles various things from characterization to storytelling, directing, pacing, literally everything, it is so, so very Japanese. And you can also see that when you look at the influences of Sonic. Now, when we're talking about influences, of course, there's going to be Oz, but, uh, Felix the Cat and Michael Jackson, Santa Claus, Bill Clinton, blah, blah, blah. And yes, there are many Western and American influences in Sonic as well. But when we're talking about the biggest, most important, and most pivotal influences in Sonic, then the number one that stands above all else is most definitely the works of Hayao Miyazaki and Studio Ghibli. Especially when we're talking about the original Sonic stuff, that especially pulls a lot from Ghibli works, especially the older ones. If you haven't seen it, I talk a little bit more about the influences of Ghibli in Sonic in my Scrapped Stories, Characters, and Concepts video uh, that you might want to go check out. I also talk there about the original origin story for Sonic that is going to be somewhat relevant to this video, as well as my What Is It About Sonic video. There are certain things that I talk about in those videos that are going to be kind of relevant to this discussion in certain ways, so if you haven't watched those videos, you may want to watch them before continuing on. But anyway, yes, Studio Ghibli and specifically Miyazaki works are very influential onto Sonic. And really, the easiest and biggest thing I can point to with that kind of thing is the original environmental theme of Sonic. I've talked about this plenty of times before in previous videos. Sonic represents nature, Eggman represents human industrialization and harm to the environment. And when Eggman does something bad and puts animals in robots and starts polluting and damaging the world, Sonic is there to fight against that. It's all a metaphor for protecting the environment, and more importantly, living in harmony with the environment. Sonic CD, in particular, really emphasizes this, where we see the bad future and everything is all ruined and destroyed and nature has been completely plowed over by Eggman's technology, but then in the good future, we see nature and technology managing to live together in harmony. 
Those ideas, that entire environmental theme in Sonic, that doesn't just come from nowhere. Like, why does that exist, do you think? Like, yes, it's obviously just probably a part of the creators of Sonic wanted to instill that kind of positive message into the series, but also I think it comes from the things they were influenced by, because if you look at various Miyazaki works, a lot of them have a similar kind of message to them, promoting harmony between people and nature. A lot of them deal with pollution or human encroaching on nature and various things like that. And the thing is, those ideas in Miyazaki works themselves come from various different aspects of Japanese culture. One big one would be Shinto, the Japanese kind of religion, but kind of not a religion. It's kind of a weird thing. Do some research on your own. It's quite interesting. But for a brief crash course from someone that has only studied Shinto very, very minimally and has a very vague cursory understanding of what it is, Essentially, to my understanding, the idea is that Shinto is the belief in Kami, and Kami are kind of like gods, but it's not exactly accurate to translate it one-to-one -to, -one to that. It's a little bit different than that, because Kami are not just these mythological figures that exist to represent some various aspects of the world. There are certain Kami that are like that, like Raijin, the Kami of storms, lightning, and thunder, but then Kami can also be things that are not just like spiritual personifications of things. They can be those things themselves. So for example, there could be a mountain and there could be a Kami associated with that mountain. The Kami of that mountain. But also a mountain itself can be a Kami. Kami are not just limited to these ethereal spirits that you might imagine. Kami can be physical things that exist in nature. They can be rivers, they can be plants, they can be rocks, they can even be real people that are alive today, or the deceased can become Kami. The definition of what a kami is is very malleable, as Shinto itself is a very malleable belief system, which is why it's not even necessarily appropriate to call it a religion. But to my grasp, generally Shinto is simply defined as the belief and respect of the kami. And kami are made of a certain kind of life essence energy that kind of exists in all things. And I believe this is why you can have kami that are mythological figures or are also physical real things that exist in the real world because all of these things are made of that same life essence energy. By the way, if this is starting to sound at all like the Force in Star Wars, there's a very good reason for that, because George Lucas was very inspired by Japanese films. And of course, Star Wars is one of the many influences of Sonic, so it all just loops back around. But anyway, what I'm really getting at here is that the general idea of Shinto is not really about what you believe in, but it's more about what you do. The philosophy of Shinto generally promotes a respect for the world around you living in harmony with nature and respecting every single thing, even inanimate objects, as if they are living things that have their own thoughts and feelings. And these kinds of ideals, even if not part of Shinto, have very much influenced just general Japanese culture, which is why we see ideas like this in things like the works of Miyazaki, promoting this idea of harmony with the world and nature itself. Oftentimes, in Miyazaki's case, very directly referencing Japanese mythology and such, but then we go to Sonic, and it's extrapolated a little bit further out into a general idea of environmentalism, but that in itself very easily complements these ideas of Shinto, harmony between people and the world. If you want to look at it in that kind of way, then Eggman doing what he does, plowing over nature and trying to take over, that is him disrespecting the Kami, and so Sonic delivers the Kami's wrath to him, undoes what he does, and makes things right, rebalances nature. Now, just to be clear, I'm not trying to say here that Sonic is uh, kind of a Shinto metaphor specifically, but what I'm just saying is that these ideas that Sonic is built on, they are very directly built into the very fabric and DNA of Japanese culture, and so they manifest in ways all over the place in various forms of Japanese media, whether intentional or not. 
And along these same lines, in a way, I think that you could look at Sonic himself and kind of make an argument that he is a Kami. Maybe not, like, literally in the real world as, like, a religious figure, but the way he's treated in the Sonic series is very along the lines of kind of how Kami are treated. This is really digging into the stuff I talked about in my What Is It About Sonic video, with Sonic being a metaphorical character more so than a literal one. It's described that Kami live in, like, an alternate existence alongside ours, and that even if we can't see them, we can interact with Kami, and they can interact with us in turn. Which is why it's important to be respectful of Kami, so that way they will bless people rather than cursing them, and various things like that. And the way that Sonic is used in various Sonic stories as an avatar for good itself, and the way he spreads that good to people, it has a very similar feel to it. If you think about, like, Sonic's original origin concept, when the Meg character is surrounded by fire and she's in danger, and the Sonic logo from the back of her jacket disappears and then saves her from danger, and, you know, she's questioning whether or not Sonic is real and he was actually able to save her there. You know, it kind of has this feel to it of, like, Sonic being some kind of mythological creature that reached out from another plane of existence to help this person out. And that is complemented by the idea of Supersonic, and how Supersonic is a manifestation of the positive thoughts and feelings of people. And with Sonic often being used to represent nature in these conflicts, then it presents that same kind of harmony, people and nature coexisting together, people giving to nature, and so it gives back to them, it protects them. Again, I'm not trying to say that literally Sonic is a Kami, but it's just part of the natural influences of Sonic that he ends up kind of being treated like that in a similar way. In fact, if we look at a tweet by Naoto Oshima when responding to the original movie Sonic design, we can see that he refers to Sonic as a fairy, and I think this is a bit of a kind of translation issue here. I don't think he's literally saying that Sonic is a fairy, but that he sees Sonic as some sort of mythical creature. He's not a physical thing that really exists in our world. Obviously, he's a video game character, and he's not just talking about Sonic here. He does also mention the same thing about Mickey, and how they are fairies that can live on when people believe in them, and how that's kind of just, uh, you know, the nature of them being fictional characters, that they exist in people's hearts, and all that sappy bullshit. But that kind of sappy bullshit, as I've talked about in my What Is It About Sonic video, that is very much part of Sonic's identity, and... The idea that Sonic, despite not being real, is kind of, in a way, out there, and you can sort of interact with Sonic, and he can interact with you, even if not directly. Which, that idea kinda has a similar vibe to it to Kami, doesn't it? You know, a little bit? Or, at the very least, maybe something along the lines of a yokai, another type of Japanese mythological creature. Speaking of yokai, let's talk about a couple of other Sonic characters and how they are very heavily influenced by various aspects of Japanese culture. For example, Tails. Obviously, Tails is inspired by the Kitsune, or the Nine-Tailed Fox. And actually, doing a little bit of research about Kitsune, I discovered that Kitsune do not always have nine tails. They gain more tails as they grow older and wiser and more powerful. And of course, with Tails just being a kid, he only has two of them, you know? It's a way to show that he is very young still. I mean, it's not an exact thing, because again, Tails isn't literally a Kitsune, because actual Kitsune lived to be like a thousand years old or whatever, but it's just meant to invoke that kind of idea. And it's, you know, clearly inspired by that sort of thing. A very explicit example of heavy Japanese influence onto the Sonic series. But other characters have very similar things. For example, Knuckles. There are two main things about Knuckles that I want to point out. First of which being the white crescent on Knuckles' chest. Do you know what that is? Do you know why that's there? Because that's not there for no reason. It's not there just because it looks cool. There was thought put into that specific detail of Knuckles' character. 
because that white crescent is the same white crescent that appear on Asian black bears on their chest. And of course, bears are very strong creatures that also live very solitary lives. The majority of a bear's life is spent alone, which both of those things are very much represented in Knuckles. He is strong and a loner that has spent his entire life by himself. But also, additionally, Japanese black bears often have an association with the kami of mountains. And Knuckles himself is often associated with the mountain as well. It's been described by Sonic Team themselves that where Sonic is the free-flowing wind, Knuckles is the unmoving mountain. Knuckles, part of the idea behind his character was that he was supposed to be the opposite of Sonic. Where Sonic emphasizes speed, Knuckles emphasizes power. And Sonic, of course, lives his very free lifestyle, just doing whatever he wants. But Knuckles is the polar opposite, living a very duty-bound life. He does not have the freedom to go around and do what he wants. Because of his role as Guardian of the Master Emerald, he has to stay in one place and be strong to protect it. He has to be a mountain. All of that can be inferred to some degree just by the inclusion of that white crescent on Knuckles' chest, and that is something that completely goes over the heads of an American audience. This is what I'm talking about. While Sonic was intended to be made for a Western audience, it still was made by Japanese people with a Japanese mindset. Another thing about Knuckles is his species, Echidna. Do you know why Knuckles is an Echidna? It might just be because it's another spiky creature like a hedgehog, so I guess that works. Well, partially, but you're not entirely there, because to understand it, we need to understand the Japanese names of hedgehogs and echidnas. Because a hedgehog in Japanese is called a Hari Nezumi, which means needle mouse. Hari is needle, Nezumi is mouse. Whereas Knuckles and Echidna, the Japanese word for Echidna, is Hari Mogura, which is a needle mole. So obviously, while they were making Knuckles and they wanted to make a rival character for Sonic, they wanted another needle creature, hence why Knuckles was made into an Echidna. That's just my own inference on things, I could be off the mark there, but I think it's extremely plausible. Another character would be Amy, specifically her interest in tarot cards and fortune telling and all that. I've already talked about this before, but that entire idea of Amy's interest in fortune telling, that comes from Japanese culture because it's fairly common in Japan for girls and young women to have an interest in fortune telling like that. And originally, when Amy was created, she was just meant to be some random regular girl, and so in order to reinforce that idea, they gave her an interest that was common for your average everyday girl, hence she is interested in fortune telling. But over in the West, that's not a thing. Girls don't have a particular fascination with fortune telling. In fact, it has the opposite effect. What was intended to depict a very common thing for girls to be interested in, now in America, to us, it's a very uncommon hobby for someone to have, and it makes Amy distinct rather than something that's supposed to depict her as a normal girl. The very idea of using fortune telling to communicate to us that Amy is a very average, typical girl is something that is very bred into Japanese culture, as that is where girls are interested in that kind of thing. Obviously, another major character that I probably don't even need to explain is Shadow, being a rival character very similar to our main character, obviously a very Vegeta-type thing. Of course, rival characters like this are not exclusive to Japanese material, but obviously Vegeta in particular was one of the most influential versions of this character to exist, and this trope is extremely common in various Japanese medias. Not to mention the fact that Shadow is basically the exact same thing as Mewtwo, the world's most powerful Pokémon created by science, aka the ultimate life form. And of course there's also Rouge, a character in a kids series who her main character attribute is her sex appeal. What the hell are you doing making a sexy character in a kids series? Well, in Japan, having sex appeal in a series aimed towards young boys is not at all uncommon. In fact, it's very, very regular. Had Sonic Adventure 2 been made by an American development team, then Rouge would not exist as a character, at least not in the form that she does. 
The very willingness to have a sexy character in a kid series like this is once again something that very much comes from a Japanese view of kids' entertainment. Cream is another character that very obviously has the Japanese nature of Sonic coming through her, because both when she meets Sonic and Blaze for the first time, she politely bows to them, and that is to depict Cream as a very well-mannered, well-behaved kid. And the way you do that in Japan is by having her respect the person that she is meeting for the first time and bow when introducing herself. Over in the West, that's not a thing and is in fact kind of weird for someone to do, but Cream does it because the very conception of her character and how it is portrayed is baked into Japanese culture. In this way, by not respecting the Japanese nature of Cream as a character, you are not handling her correctly. If Cream was to meet a character for the first time and introduce herself and not bow to that character, then that would be bad characterization for Cream. She would be out of character for not doing that because it's been established that she does that and her behavior is very in line with that kind of Japanese politeness. So, as you can see, there is a lot of Japanese influence in the Sonic characters, and there's a lot of Japanese influence in other aspects of Sonic. For example, the way that people speak. A lot of people have repeatedly asked me why I use the Japanese versions of the games when I do my story videos, and that's because the Japanese versions in most cases are the real versions of the stories. The ones actually written by the writer of the stories, the versions that they intended for the audience to get. Again, Sonic was made for America, blah blah, but if that's the case, then why are there so many things that are lost when we go to the English translation of things? For example, I previously talked about Shadow's use of Boku as his self-pronoun and how that is indicative of certain aspects of his character and things like that are completely lost when you go to the English version, as well as various other aspects of how Sonic characters speak. There is a lot of stuff in the way that character dialogue is written in Japanese storytelling that does not exist in English storytelling that you just simply do not get when you go to the English versions that are there in the Japanese versions, that are there in the versions written by the actual writers. Here's an example. If we go to Sonic Heroes and we listen to what characters say when they level up in the Japanese dub, then we hear... Everybody says level up in English, except for Espio. Instead, he says... That word that he uses instead of up, to my understanding, means to rise or ascend, so it's basically communicating the same thing. But the fact that he doesn't say up in English like all the other characters do, that is supposed to say something about his character. Whereas everybody else incorporates something more modern and English into their vocabulary, Espio leans more toward traditional Japanese, and there's a lot of stuff like that about the way that he speaks specifically. He has very old-fashioned traditional Japanese language in a lot of his dialogue, and that is because he is a ninja, a very Japanese thing, and so to reinforce that, they give him that little detail in his speech. And that just doesn't exist when you go to English. The characters literally have less characterization when you go to English because certain things just cannot properly be translated. How on earth could something be made for Americans when there are so many details that literally could not be understood by Americans all over the place? There's also other things, like the fact that the lip-syncing in Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 was set to the Japanese audio, not the English audio. Now, granted, they did change that with Sonic Heroes going forward, but clearly, initially, their idea was Japanese is the way for Sonic. And we can even see that in the English dub, where in Sonic Adventure 2, characters say Japanese phrases sometimes, like when Sonic attacks the Egg Golem and he says Teria in the English dub. Or when Eggman goes to pet a chow and he says Yosh, or when Knuckles is digging and he goes Ora Ora Ora. 
these are all Japanese phrases that mean nothing in English, and it makes no sense for the characters to be saying these things, but they were made to say them in the English dub because the people in charge of the dub were people that spoke Japanese. And so they wanted these Japanese things in the dub, even though it's not appropriate for English. And you know what? Beyond every single thing that I've talked about so far in this video, all of that is small time compared to the real fundamental Japanese nature of Sonic that overshadows literally everything I've said so far that goes all the way back to the very foundational elements of storytelling, which is that Sonic as a series, everything about it from a creative standpoint, the way that the characters are written, the way the world is done, the way the stories are told, it is all built around Japanese and Eastern storytelling because Western and Eastern storytelling are very, very different. And I'm not just talking about the way that characters are written or the way dialogue is done, the tropes that are used. I'm talking about from like a writing structural perspective, the way that a story is actually told is done differently in Japanese stuff versus Western stuff. There are different writing techniques and methodologies and story structures that are used, different forms of characterization, different ways to express that characterization, different themes that are made important or less important, and different entire philosophies about how to handle writing and storytelling. And this is the real backbone that makes every single thing in Sonic. The way that the stories are told is so extremely, intensely Japanese. And this is something that's really, really hard to talk about without going in, like, extreme detail about the very nature and fundamental elements of writing and how you do it and what the differences are. But one video that I would point you to that does a really good job of explaining it is Western versus Eastern Storytelling, What's the Difference by Literature Devil. Go check out that video, he does a very, very good job of explaining a lot of the big ideas that make these different styles of writing different. But even that doesn't cover everything because there is so much to this. To try to tackle and explain this a little bit here, what I'm gonna say is that oftentimes many people claim that Sonic is shonen. What does that actually mean? Shonen is simply a target demographic in Japanese entertainment. It means that something is targeted towards young boys. But lots of stuff is targeted towards young boys outside of Japan, like, for example, superheroes. Are superheroes shonen? Well, no, because superheroes are built with a very Western storytelling methodology in mind. Shonen stuff, obviously, is Japanese, and so it uses a very Japanese structure to how everything is done. And I apologize, but again, it's very hard to verbalize what those differences are in how things are handled without getting really into it. Like, that could be a whole video on its own that could just go on and on and on. So let me just give you a couple of specific examples of very specifically Japanese and Eastern storytelling techniques that you see in Japanese media that you don't see very often in Western media. One thing in particular that I think stands out a lot is that a lot of times action and shonen series will have an emphasis on strength of character, not physical strength, not some kind of magical strength, not the ability to beat people up and defeat your enemies, but a strength of person, an internal strength, a conviction that somebody has that they stick to and they believe in no matter what. One example of this that I think depicts it quite well is this one specific scene of Yakuza 0. In this scene, Kiryu, the main character, someone that he cares about, has been wronged by this guy here. But this guy wants Kiryu to betray that person and start working for him, and that there's a lot of benefits for Kiryu if he sells this person out that he was working for previously. But Kiryu refuses to do that. He will absolutely not let this guy get his way because Kiryu has a bond to this other person and he is loyal to them and he will not sacrifice that loyalty for anything. And so the guy tells him, okay, but just so you know, I got a bunch of shooters out that door waiting for you to come out and if you walk out that door without signing up with me, I'm gonna have you shot and killed. And Kiryu does not falter to this at all. He goes anyway, and he opens up that door, and in this case, it turns out that was actually a bluff. That was a threat 
to get Kiryu to crumple and then sell out this other person, but he didn't do that. The fact that this was an empty threat is irrelevant. The important thing here is that when faced with this tough situation where his life was on the line, Kiryu still would not compromise his loyalty to this person. This is a type of scene that I refer to as a demonstration of character, and you see this kind of thing quite frequently in lots of Japanese action series. One series in particular that does this a lot is One Piece. One Piece has demonstrations of character all fucking over the place. One of the best examples of that would be the character of Zoro, one of the main characters who is a swordsman, and his goal in life is to become the greatest swordsman in the world. And there is a greatest swordsman in the world in One Piece in this character named Mihawk, and when Zoro encounters Mihawk for the first time, he challenges him to a duel. If he can defeat Mihawk in a fight, then there you go, he gets crowned greatest swordsman in the world. However, at this point in the series, Zoro is not even close to a match for Mihawk, and he gets totally destroyed here. And Zoro's desire to become the greatest swordsman in the world is so great that he would rather die than lose the fight. And so when he does lose the fight, he presents himself to Mihawk to accept a finishing blow. He acknowledges that he has failed at completing his life's mission, and so he is ready to see it to the end. He wanted to accomplish that goal, and he knew that goal would involve putting his life on the line, and he has failed, so he is ready to accept the consequences of that failure. Being an honorable swordsman is more important to him than that, and his ability to put his own survival below his ambitions, that takes an immense amount of dedication, a very strong character. Another great example from One Piece would be the character of Whitebeard, the strongest man in the world. And he eventually, at one point in the series, dies. But specifically, the thing I want to talk about is the fact that he dies standing up. He does not fall over even when he is a corpse. Nothing in the entire world, not even dying, can make this man fall to his knees. That is how strong his character is. We can also see the exact same thing over in Twilight Princess when Ganon is killed. He is too strong to let death knock him over. And again, this is not about physical power. This is about how internally Ganon is too mighty, too powerful of a person to fall over dead. His character is too strong for that and demands more respect from even life itself to the point where he does not fall when he dies. These kinds of ideas and these kinds of scenes, these demonstrations of one strong character, they are very prominent storytelling devices in Eastern storytelling, but they are not that common in Western storytelling. Sometimes they do happen, of course, there's always exceptions to everything, but they're not that frequent, and even when they do show up, they're usually done in very different ways, with different meanings behind them. And when we look at the Sonic series, you can see these kinds of things present all over the place. The biggest example of this is, like, the entirety of Sonic and the Black Knight. One of everyone's favorite Sonic stories, the whole thing is a demonstration of Sonic's character. Time and time again, Sonic is put in these situations where he follows his beliefs and does what he wants and acts in the way that he wants to regardless of the consequences. In fact, he doesn't even really think about the consequences because he's more interested in living the way that he wants. That's what the entire game is about, demonstrating his character, which is why he gets crowned as King Arthur. His character is shown to be strong enough to be worthy. He is virtuous enough to be King Arthur. Granting Sonic that title is the acknowledgement of the strength of his character. Literally, the entirety of Sonic and the Black Knight's story hinges on a very Eastern Japanese storytelling technique. 
And when we look at Western created and written sonic works, these kinds of ideas do not exist. They are not present because they are made by creators with a different background, a different culture that they're from, and a different understanding of storytelling. They use different techniques to convey different ideas, which is not to say that one is better or worse than the other, but Sonic specifically is very much baked in Japanese storytelling methodologies. And when you look at even extended Japanese Sonic media, we see those same kinds of things. In the Sonic OVA, when Metal Sonic is defeated, he is falling into this lava and Sonic goes to pull him out because his enemy is no longer a danger. But Metal Sonic bats Sonic's hand away. He does not want to be saved, and he says that there is only one Sonic. This is because of Metal's mentality, that he is a copy of Sonic, and so he wants to eliminate the original Sonic so he can be the one and only Sonic. That is what he strives for. That is what he believes in. He believes in the one true Sonic, and he thinks it's him. But when he is defeated, he realizes that he is not the real Sonic, but he sticks true to his convictions and his belief in there only being one Sonic, and so he allows himself to be destroyed. Now, doesn't that sound a little bit familiar? Another example I would point to is the big epic supersonic climaxes that so many Sonic games end with. That is something that once again you see from time to time in Japanese media. The hugely grandiose, massive spectacle, crazy over-the-top finale where things go to astronomical levels, oftentimes literally. This specific kind of escalation for a finale you can see in lots of things, like Gunbuster, Evangelion, Gurren Lagann, Platinum Games does it a lot, things like Bayonetta, Wonderful 101, lots of stuff by Trigger does it, Kill the Kill, and various other things. Persona does it, it happens at the end of Gravity Rush 2, Kirby does it all the time. Even Mario has started to do it with things like Mario Odyssey and Bowser's Fury. And a common thing that you'll see amongst all of these things is that they are all Japanese. And I need to clarify here that this is not just about getting really, really big at the end. This is not just about fighting some ancient giant monster demon creature. This is not just about going to space or whatever. This is the kind of thing I was talking about where it's hard to describe these kinds of differences because they can be so ethereal if you don't understand storytelling techniques. It's not about the size, it's not about how big something gets, it's about the escalation, not just literally, but also emotionally. It's about how people come together and pull on their inner strength to defeat such an overwhelmingly powerful force. It's about everything in the story leading up to this final moment where everything emotionally contributes into this energy that is used to defeat the opposition. In short, it's the power of friendship crap that you see all the time in stuff, especially like Japanese RPGs and things like that. But that idea, there is a commonality there across all of these different things. Like, if we look at the ending of Gurren Lagann, then you have the very fate of living beings themselves being threatened by this entity, and to fight this entity, you have literally every single living thing in the entire universe coming together to create and power a mecha literally the size of an entire galaxy, and it is fueled by the fighting spirit of everyone in the entire universe, all working together to fight for the ability to live. Everyone is putting every single thing they have into defeating this enemy, not just physically, but internally. All of their strength and power and beliefs, all of it goes into this robot that is used to defeat the enemy. And do you see how that has very similar energy to it to the ending of Sonic Unleashed, where Sonic and Chip work together to defeat Dark Gaia? This is what I'm talking about. This is something that you see really only in Japanese media. It's really not a thing that happens very much in Western media, and the only times that it does happen is in things that are very heavily influenced by Japanese stuff, like Undertale. 
These types of storytelling techniques are very much bred in the Japanese ethos of how to tell a story, which is why I say that Sonic is fundamentally Japanese. The very backbone of everything that makes up Sonic storytelling, it's all built off of Japanese ideals and philosophies and storytelling techniques and creative methods. And keep in mind, these examples that I've gone into here, these are hyper-specific. There are countless more things in the Sonic series that are like this, that are very, very woven into the fabric of Japanese storytelling. This is why, to me, the argument that Sonic was made for Americans or made for an international audience holds no weight, because while that may have been the goal, at the end of the day, Sonic is still very, very Japanese in its nature. Made for Americans does not mean made with American creative processes in mind. It's not like they thoroughly studied Western motifs and storytelling techniques in order to emulate it and create something that felt very Western. They made something in a very Japanese way because that's the only way they knew to make something, and they just tried to appeal to Americans with that Japanese creative process. And because of that, I'm going to say something that's maybe a bit extreme here, and I imagine many people are going to disagree with me on this, but I personally feel that you really can't have something that is actually genuinely true to what Sonic really is if it's made by Western creators, because they're not going to make it with an Eastern methodology in mind, because they don't understand that Eastern methodology, at least not without studying it thoroughly and trying to create something that is faithful to those Japanese storytelling techniques, which is possible, it has been done. The game Bug Fables is a great example of something that you clearly can tell that they understand the Japanese storytelling, and they manage to make something that is faithful to it. So it can be done, but when you look at all of the Western-made Sonic story media that has ever been created officially, none of it manages to do that. Clearly, none of the creatives have studied Japanese storytelling and understand it, or at the very least, they're not interested in trying to make something that respects the original creative view from which Sonic came from. And because of that, it will never feel right to me. It will never be correct. If there is not that heavy Japanese influence in the very foundational storytelling ideas of Sonic, then to me, it's just not Sonic. It's not right. And I don't just say that as a fundamental principle. When I read the comics, when I watch the movies, when I watch the cartoons, it just doesn't feel right. It's not Sonic to me. It doesn't feel correct. It's missing a certain key ingredient that makes something truly Sonic. Sonic is fundamentally Japanese, and a Western view of what Sonic is, that's not Sonic.